Great to see everyone again this evening. What comes to mind when you hear the name of the Apostle Paul? Do you consider the fact that his life is one of the strongest arguments for the validity of Christianity? I want you to listen to some of the words that F.F. F. Bruce once wrote. He said the conversion and apostleship of St. Paul alone, duly considered, was of itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation. When you think about the life of Saul of Tarsus, the way he vehemently fought against the church and against Christianity, and see the conversion of him and how he became the great Apostle Paul, who fought just as vehemently to support the faith in Christ. Yes, his conversion speaks a lot about the validity of Christianity and the power of the gospel. When you think of Paul, do you think of the reality of God's mercy and his grace? I know when Paul thought of his past life and what he was then living as a Christian, he knew that he was a recipient of God's mercy and grace, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. When you think of Paul, do you think about how God used him to write the majority of the New Testament that we have in our hands today? Fourteen books out of 27, if you count the book of Hebrews. But what I want to focus on this evening is Paul as an evangelist of love. This study ought to challenge us to do as Paul urged others, to be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now, there may be some who find a lot of encouragement in studying Paul's life. You see the possibility of change that is strongly demonstrated in his conversion. We can even see the likelihood of endurance and patience as Paul struggled with the opposition that he had to face not from just the world, but even from the church. We may even learn courage from Paul as he taught the gospel. And when his life was even threatened, he never wavered. Today, I want to look at the message that Paul preached, and I also want to look at the man who preached it. Now, this lesson, of course, is not just for preachers. It is for anyone and everyone who evangelizes, anyone who teaches the gospel to others, whether man or woman, it doesn't matter whether you're preaching from a pulpit or doing one-on-one -on -one Bible study with someone. We need to look at the message that we preach and consider ourselves as an evangelist and what kind of person we ought to be. Now we can learn a lot about the emphasis that Paul placed upon the message of Jesus Christ just by studying the Corinthian epistles. If you're already there, I encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.17 that he had been sent to preach the gospel. Now that word preach is kind of interesting. It means to proclaim as a herald. I want to give you a little etymology of the word herald, some background of that word. The herald was someone who had important news to bring. He often announced an athletic event or religious festival or functioned as a political messenger. He was the bringer of some news or command from the king's court. He was to have a strong voice and proclaim his message with vigor and without lingering to discuss it. The herald's most important qualification was that he faithfully represent or report the word of the one by whom he had been sent. He was not to be original in his message but was to be that of another. The importance of the herald was in what he did, not especially who he was. And as we look at the verses that follow, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, we will notice Paul's emphasis upon the message that he preached. In verse 18, he says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. We notice that his emphasis is concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. In verse 23, Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. Again, the cross of Christ at the heart of his message, and no doubt, it is the heart of Christianity. And of course, Paul did not want people to be impressed with his method 
the way he preached and thus missed the message that he was trying to get across. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, we see the cross at the heartbeat of his message. Now later, Paul continued to emphasize the message that he proclaimed by emphasizing in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, the gospel which I preached unto you, by which you are also saved. This is a very important message. It contains things needed for the salvation of our souls. This declaration that he gave here in 1 Corinthians 15 has quite an interesting background to it. He has just concluded the most detailed discussion of spiritual gifts that we find in any one place in the New Testament. In chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, he had enumerated the spiritual gifts, all nine of them, beginning with the word of wisdom and ending with the interpretation of tongues. In chapter 13, he discussed the duration of these miraculous powers. In verse 10 of chapter 13, he says, until that which is perfect is come. That word perfect doesn't mean sinless. It is actually the Greek word teleon, meaning it's complete. So it's not talking about the return of Christ. It's talking about when the revelation of God is complete, then the miraculous would cease. In chapter 14, Paul gave the inspired regulation for the practicing of these spiritual gifts, the proper use of the tongues, the right use of prophecy. But in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Paul reminded the Corinthians that they were not saved by miracles, but they were saved by the gospel which Paul had preached unto them. Paul continued his emphasis of this very same message even into the second epistle that he wrote to the Corinthians. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Notice what he said. <clears throat> For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. When Paul preached Jesus Christ as Lord, he was emphasizing his authority. And there's no doubt that we need to have the same emphasis in our preaching today just as much as it was needed back then in the first century. I mean, isn't this the burning issue concerning religion today? Why we have all the division among so-called Christianity? It has to do with the authority of Jesus Christ. Why do we practice what we do in religion? Why don't we practice and sometimes even oppose things that are taught in religion in some places? And who, who or what is going to be our authority? I mean, is it going to be our conscience? Is it going to be religious leaders? Is it going to be Latter-day Saints? Or maybe what the movie stars suggest. They've always got an opinion, you know. You know, to these questions, Millions sadly answer yes. But if Jesus is going to be respected as Lord, then he's going to have to be accepted as God's final spokesman to humankind today. This is emphasized in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. We are to listen to God's Son today. He is the authority. And if Jesus is acknowledged as Lord, he's got to be respected as the head of the church, Colossians 1 verse 18. And one who does have all authority, both in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18. Now Paul's emphasis on the message is seen in many of Paul's letters. For example, the affirmation that the scriptures are inspired of God, just right after that in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, he urged Timothy, the preacher, to preach the word. The reproving, the rebuking, the exhorting that were to be done in doctrine and teaching was going to come from the God-breathed scripture. And Paul continually urged people to look at the message that Jesus Christ gave to mankind. It's important and it's necessary for our salvation. 
But why is the emphasis upon the message so important today? Well, that's very simple to answer, because we can't be saved without it. Listen to Paul's words to various congregations that he wrote to. In Romans 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, he says, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. To the Ephesian church, he said in Ephesians 1.13, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Paul, with good reason, put a lot of emphasis into his message. We need to be doing the same thing today. But what about the man behind the message? I mean, he is a vital part of the preaching, is he not? Now, Paul's past life was not ignored. It wasn't doctored to tone it down in efforts that he did to try to destroy the church. In fact, I think that his early life actually is what formed his character. I want to look at Paul's life as he progressed through the years. In infancy, Paul was given the name of Israel's first king. He was named Saul. The Hebrew name for Saul means asked for. Well, later on, he changed his name to Paulos, a Roman word, or Paul, which means little. Paul was born in Tarsus, and he was born as a Roman citizen. The Tarsians, of course, they had great enthusiasm for philosophy and education in general, even above the Athenians and the Alexandrians and anyone who resided in the so-called university cities. So he was definitely born in a culture that valued education, and Paul was educated. Now, he was born of Jewish parents. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin. He was very knowledgeable in Jewish law and also religion, and that's because of the way Jewish boys were brought up. In fact, Jewish law prescribed that a boy begin the study of the scriptures at the early age of five years old. By the time that he was 10 years old, he was already studying the legal traditions. By the time he reached 15, he became a bar mitzvah, 13, I'm sorry. He became a bar mitzvah, at which time he took upon himself the full obligation of the law. And he took his education very seriously. Now, Paul was also of the sect of the Pharisees. And that name Pharisee means separated ones. And they were the people who were determined after Babylonian captivity that they were going to remain separated from the Gentiles. They were going to make sure that the Jews and the Gentiles remained separated. And they placed a lot of emphasis upon Jewish tradition, which was the source of a lot of the clashes between them and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's pedigree and his educational preparation equipped him to become a great servant of God to both Jew and Gentile. He was born and he was reared in a Gentile city. He was educated at the seat of Judaism's uh, recognized doctors of law. In fact, it says that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. When Paul was converted to Christ, he poured the same zeal and dedication in building the Lord's church up in which he used to try to destroy the church in his former years. One man said, The greatest event in the history of human race was the birth of Jesus. The greatest event in the life of Jesus was his resurrection from the dead. The next momentous occurrence was the conversion of Paul. And yes, Paul became a great benefit to the world and to Christianity. Now one can gain a lot of insight into Paul's life and work by reading what he told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. If you want to turn over there, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 27. In Acts chapter 20, verse 18, he said that he had been with the elders at all seasons. Now, that doesn't mean that the road that he was traveling was always smooth. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, he said that he fought with the beast at Ephesus. Not only did the pagans pose a threat to him, 
But even some of his own Jewish brethren sought to destroy him. They considered him a turncoat, a traitor. And they considered him as not worthy to live. But through it all, in verse 19, he says he'd been serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Even with all that stress upon him, he served the Lord in humility. That's where he found his peace. He was a servant. He served in his preaching, his teaching, and the writing of God's word. And Paul became great, and he did so by becoming a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, he had learned that the kingdom of heaven is only realized by those who are poor in spirit, those who walk humbly. And yes, Paul had to learn to do that from what he was in his previous life to what he is now as a Christian. He had a lot of pride in himself, in his education, but he had to humble himself, and he had to bow before the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul was courageous in declaring God's whole counsel Acts chapter 20, verse 27. And he preached not only publicly, but he also preached from house to house, verse 20. It's important that we don't just try to preach only from the pulpit. I was telling my class this morning that most well-known, good gospel preachers can count on one hand how many they have converted strictly from the pulpit. And I can say I've never converted anybody strictly from the pulpit. It always began with you in the audience. You all made the contact. You all said the first thing to get them to understand or to even begin to listen or to open up the scriptures. But it always begins with you. Without you, there would be no conversions. That's an important thing that we need to understand. He preached publicly and from house to house. Now, Paul's work was very difficult, no doubt. You look at some of the things that he wrote about himself and all the suffering that he'd go through. And you kind of wonder, what was it that kept Paul motivated, even though he had opposition from every side? Well, I think it's his profound gratitude for God's grace that was upon him. I want you to listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. He says, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He had such a deep love for the Lord that he was actually constrained by that love for 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. But he also had a firm faith in the reality that there was going to be a life after this life. Yes, heaven was a reality to Paul. And judgment was just as sure as death, and he knew he was going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul knew the Lord. He was not a myth to him. He knew in the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he never walked with him. The Lord was a resurrected living reality, and this knowledge gave Paul the strength to fight the battles that he did and to hold on to the very end. Even to the point that he could say the words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. What wonderful words. Paul traveled extensively throughout the Roman world to preach the gospel the good news to mankind. Paul was an object of God's love that was shown in Christ. Paul knew that Christ died for sinners, of whom he was the chief of sinners for whom Christ died, and he certainly appreciated what Christ did for him. Paul knew that if men love God, then they're going to obey from the heart, Romans chapter 6, verse 17 through 18, and that they will serve the Lord from a heart of love. That's what we have to do if we are truly compassionate for the souls of men and truly thankful for what Christ Jesus has done for us. What a great example that Paul was of evangelism and love. He loved the Lord, so he is willing to obey him. And he is willing to extensively labor for him. 
He loved the souls of men, so much so that he is willing to preach the message of salvation to all of them, anybody and everybody that would listen to them and even those that wouldn't listen. He loved the gospel so much that he was willing to preach the whole counsel of God, and he was willing to preach it in its purity, knowing that if he ever tried to contaminate it, then it would lose its power to save, and it would cost him his soul too. But love is what motivates us to do all of this as we go about and we preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost souls. And if we don't have the love for lost souls, we're not going to be motivated to do any of this. Does the love of God motivate you to follow Paul in the example that he gave us? Are you willing to obey God's plan of salvation? so that you can be saved from your sins. Jesus Christ gave us that plan of salvation and that part of the Bible that we call the New Testament. We have to know what it says. Jesus is very plain. If we don't obey the gospel, then we're not going to be able to be saved from our sins and we will be lost eternally in a devil's hell. Christ doesn't want that. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And that's the type of love that we need to have for others, too. We want, you to, we want to see your soul in heaven. And if anybody ever desires someone to go to hell, there's something wrong with them, and they need to check their attitude. Be a recipient of God's mercy and his grace. Taste and see how sweet that really is. If you haven't obeyed the gospel... By being baptized for the remission of your sins, we encourage you to do that, and do that today, and don't wait another moment. If you are a child of God, are you really living the Christian life that you should? The example that Paul set for us? Are you laboring extensively in the kingdom because of what Christ has done for you? Are you just letting everybody else do that for you? If there's anything that we can help you with this evening, whatever it may be, maybe you need the prayers of the congregation. We'd be glad to pray with you and for you. If there's anything that we can help you with, won't you respond this evening while together we stand and sing.